Welcome to the Welcome. Invest the Difference podcast. We're going to talk about how to grow and scale your life and business by investing in and doubling down on difference makers. So whether it's mindset growth, tactical business strategies, or identifying your unique edge, let's invest the difference and change the world. Welcome back, everybody, to the Invest the Difference podcast. Super excited today as we have another expert genius guest on the show today. Uh, our guest today is the founder and CEO of Ion Franchising, uh, industry leading franchise consulting and development company representing over 700 brands, multi unit, multi brand, multi state type of work here. So, super excited to have Lance. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. We're excited to dive in into the tacticalities around either like identifying franchises that are, are, are opportunities for some of our audience or you know, kind of what you go through in your process around identifying opportunities there. But we also want to talk through the development side, right? Because you're an expert on both ends. You, you, you can either pair or you can develop, which is kind of a really cool, cool Swiss Army knife in that industry. Um, so super excited to kind of dive into the tacticality there. Um, but before we get into it, Absolutely. tell us about Lance. Like, tell, you know, who Lance is and how did Lance get into this world? Uh, it's a crazy, crazy, crazy story, but we all have those crazy stories. I grew up in New York. I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. It is always fascinating to me that, you know, where did we all come from and how did we be become who we are? Was it this? Uh, was it a lab accident that went wrong? Was it environmental? <laughs> in my case, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. And when I'm educating people on business ownership, I explain to them that, look, there's three major investment pillars out there. One is everything relating to Wall Street. Another is real estate. And the third is being your own boss. And I grew up with all three of those pillars unfolding at my kitchen table with my real estate attorney grandfather, my uh, business owner, entrepreneur grandfather, number two, that Polish immigrant barely spoke English and had a chain of supermarkets throughout Brooklyn and Queens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then dad, dad's company was the largest over-the-counter trading house on Wall Street. And let me tell you something, work ethic uh, was pretty incredible in my day. Nobody ever had a day off. Everybody worked their asses off. And that's how I grew up and became successful. I miss period. those days. So <laughs> I, I fell into franchising truth, truthfully when I was bored on Wall Street. And dad says to me, hey, Uncle Steven is building a billion-dollar restaurant company in Arizona. Why don't you go visit him and see if that's something you want to do? And we ended up building a TGI Fridays franchise in the late 80s to 225 million a year. A lot of acquisitions, some new builds as well, but within within uh, five and a half years. So that was a hell of an education of mine, listening to him negotiate leases and everything. And uh, that, but that got me started in franchising. And I realized, wait a second, this is freaking easy. I got to I get to follow somebody else's system. You know, and, and Fridays is a whole other story because there are some brands that peter as time goes on. You know, those yeah. big box bar restaurant concepts, even today, are incredibly difficult. But that, that as an aside, most people don't realize that franchising isn't just all restaurants. Um, there are 5,000 plus franchise brands and you know, from home care to business services, and virtually anybody with an SBA loan can jump into a franchise with very little cash. So that's how it all got started for me. And today as yeah. a franchise broker, I show people brands that fit them, whether they're believers in franchising or not, I can make them a believer and show you the proof, show you that profit path, which I know you two love to hear about. I think it's funny when people don't believe in things. Right, like I don't believe in franchising. I'm like, well, it's very real. Like, it's, it's, it's literally right there. Like, <laughs> you know, like uh, we we work with specifically. I, I hear it uh, with a few families that have depth in some big franchise brands. So I, I understand that world. Uh, you know, probably at one percent level that that you do, but you actually brought up something really interesting that I want to just jump in straight into. Like, let's just go into it. Like you said. 
anybody with an SBA loan can get into a franchise and very little cash. How does that one statement specifically apply in today's world where an SBA loan is is, you know, is bordering 10% interest? Does it the, does the still cash flow? Is the opportunity still there? Yeah. No, there's no doubt. There's no doubt that uh, it is always more difficult when you are uh, using leverage and especially expensive money. But you know what, guys? It goes back to look how anybody that's listening that's ever done real estate fix and flips or anything else like that. You're not using, you know, what I call clean, low interest money. In most cases, you're leveraging hard money loans, especially when you're getting started. No different for this business. So if you want to consider an SBA loan almost junk bond level yeah. financing, then that's what it is. But the idea is. Look, it's it's all the starting point. It's all a starting point. You've heard plenty of people out there say, you want to do something bad enough, throw it on a credit card. Well, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I've screwed up quite a few things in my past, just jumping in, not having an appropriate foundation. My problems in the past are mo mostly due to trusting partners, which is a whole yeah. other conversation for another day. But the answer is yes, you can absolutely do it with an SBA loan today. You guys are probably well aware. Some of the audience might be aware, but SBA loans are 2.75% above prime. That's the interest rate. There's no such thing as a fixed SBA loan. And uh, the good news is it is a variable rate. So when rates come down, hopefully next year, I don't think we're going to see them come down this year. <laughs> mm. But, uh, you know, you, you have the ability to do a refi or, uh, you know, yeah. whatever. Figure out some other financing as you start cash flow. Lance, let me ask you this. As somebody who knows very little myself about franchises, um, you know, we kind of explored an opportunity last year at some point. So I got a, a quick little tutorial on it. But how do you know if a, if a franchise is a – a good opportunity for you or not? Like, why Why would I even want to consider possibly getting into the franchise business? Such a wonderful question. I think it all starts with, when I was talking about the three pillars of investing, if you're deciding that, hey, I want to have a business, you need to consider franchising because it would be silly not to consider franchising. And so when you're considering a franchise, it's a lot of integrity in the process. You can still pick the wrong brand for you, which is a problem, like picking the wrong spouse. I did that <laughs> the first time around. I'm not proud of it, but I'm telling you, I did it. So the bottom line <laughs> is when okay. you get a franchise disclosure document in your hand after you're exploring a brand, there's 23 items in every franchise disclosure document. It's like reading your mortgage in a way. But franchising is regulated by the federal government. So in those 23 items, there's an item 19, which is really an earnings claim. And you're going to see great information in there that's going to tell you, you know, it's pretty cool. This air conditioning franchise, the average franchisee does three and a half million in revenue. And this is audited information. And likewise, as you proceed in the process with a brand, any great franchise brand that I introduce you to, you'll have an opportunity to speak to existing franchisees. We call that the validation process. And when you speak to existing franchisees, what are smart people like you going to be asking them? Would you do it over again? Do they support you? Do they make money? Do you make money? Uh, things like that. How much money do you make? And you'll find that when you're talking to people that are really happy and you feel like there's a cultural fit, this is a brand for you. But, you know, look, brands like Quiznos in the past have given franchising a black eye. They did some bad things to franchisees. Franchisees lost a lot of sales, lost a lot of money. They were greedy. They put stores on top of each other. Franchise laws are set up to protect franchisees as well. But you got to pick the right franchise. And that's what I'm going to help you with. What industry generally produces some of your favorite franchises? Well, no doubt, everybody listening, including you two, it's all about restaurants for a lot of people. They're very visible. Everybody knows McDonald's and Chick-fil-A and Wingstop and Krispy Kreme Donuts. Wingstop and Krispy Kreme are brands that I owned before. 
was president of the Franchise Advisory Council for Wingstop in the early days when most of my friends didn't even want to get into Wingstop. Like, what's that? Just chicken wings? <laughs> well, they didn't, they didn't share my vision. So restaurants are incredibly prominent. And then you have other retail brands that you see in every shopping center in America, like Great Clips and Supercuts and, uh, you know, waxing places like European Wax Center. And there's one by my house in Vegas, it's going to be on my podcast soon, called The Birthday Suit that's already expanded to three, four, four different states. So the retail brands are certainly most prominent and top of mind because that's who we see every day. The reality, though, is home service brands like roofing and air conditioning, all the businesses that we now know are essential businesses. If we didn't know that word essential before the pandemic, we knew it after the pandemic Mm -hmm. because that meant brands that we could not live without, right? So home service brands, whether it's uh, roofing or air conditioning or electrical, and you don't have to be a technician, to do any of those businesses. So the home services brands have never, ever, ever been hotter. The other segment, I saw Mike Rowe talking about this, the dirty jobs guy. Mike Rowe was talking about home care. A lot of people still have no idea what home care is. Really, it's companion care. When people are getting older these days, we call it aging in place. Now, Mm -hmm. it's not just throwing your grandfather, grandmother, or parents in assisted living in, a, in another facility, people want to stay in their homes, age in place, and home care franchises, of which I have many. And it's all about companion care, making somebody a sandwich, changing the TV channel, fluffing their pillow, giving them a sponge bath, maybe shopping for them. So home care brands are freaking hot. Yeah, I had a guy doing validation recently on a home care brand and the franchisee just so happened to talk to their one of their number one franchisees he goes yeah on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar investment i did four million in sales last year and net over a million my client was like wait what (laughs) (laughs) what yeah you net over a million dollars in a year and you invested a hundred and fifty thousand what have you seen an and, uptick? And not, you know, not everybody's going to have those results. Have you seen an uptick in new franchises being created since the pandemic? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, since since uh, technology has really become omnipresent, franchising has taken off. Because now with technology in place, from things like learning management systems to get staff up to speed to, uh, you know, the internet and... Uh, call centers, you know, uh, one of the biggest advantages that franchise brands have over over independents is speed. Mm -hmm. An average independent, if you're a painter, are you answering your phone when you're painting? No. Franchises have call centers and someone is going to answer that call or the home advisor or Angie's List inquiry immediately get you a bid, get you the information you need. So to answer your question, Bernadette, yeah, there has been a major uptick in franchising over the years, especially through the pandemic. Franchising killed it through the pandemic, especially as people are stuck at home. And you're like, wait a second, we've been saying we're going to get this floor redone for five years. We need to get it done now. We're home all the time. No issues setting appointments. We're here. Come on in. (laughs) So... As we're going down that path, right, to dispel the myth, because I imagine somebody that that is a technical individual that, like, let's just say they want to start their own AC company, right? They go, why would I pay somebody for their brand when I can go build my own AC company? Like, let's let's work backwards there. So how do we break through question. that wall, right? This is an easy wall, though. It's a, it's a difficult wall for people that have thick heads and don't want to listen. Here's the reality, because you asked a fantastic (laughs) question. I've only been doing this 30 years. So this is one of my absolute favorite questions. And I was talking to a guy recently that had an air conditioning company. Okay? He was stalled. He didn't know that, but he was. He was plateauing at about $750,000 a year. He was happy with the money he's making, netting over 20%, working for himself, working his ass off. 
And he said, why the heck would I do an air conditioning franchise? Why would I pay somebody a $40,000 franchise fee to join and then pay them a 6 or 8% royalty, depending on what the royalty is, ongoing you know, for life? And I said, because you're only doing $700,000, $750,000 a year. An average independent air conditioning company is going to do whatever the number is these days from the air con- HVAC associations. $800,000 a year. Whatever the number is, maybe let's call it a million. My favorite air conditioning franchise, the average franchisee is doing three and a half million a year. Why is it? Why is it so different? I think different? you can afford why, to pay like, a four. Why is it such a drastic difference? What was though? that? Why is it such a drastic difference? Right, like, because of scale, systems. because of systems. Like what? What brings systems? Mark systems and marketing. What most people do. You're asking better questions than most people. I give you lot, lots of credit. <laughs> the the truth is, the truth is, being a business owner myself, when I was with Wingstop and there were people that were struggling to get their sales to where they needed to be, a lot of people have a difficult time in the beginning investing in their people, having the appropriate staffing, okay? So what happens in the HVAC business, which is the specific question yeah. or issue we're talking about, is owners will not hire the appropriate amount of people. And all of a sudden, jobs take longer. You can't complete the job. You won't be able to get to the customer within a timely basis. And sales falter because of that. Short answer. Yeah, so so let me let me pivot here for a minute, right? Because I, I, I love uh, growing and scaling businesses. It's truly, uh, I'm a nerd in that space. Do you consider franchising scaling? Like, let's just say Absolutely. we are a business, right? Like, and we want to grow and scale our business. Why would someone franchise versus doing like a private equity joint venture type of location? Like, let's just say I want to launch a new location of my business. Instead of me going down the franchise route, I'm going to go find an operator and let them buy into that location, not in a franchise model, but like a more of a joint venture type. Yep. Funny you should ask that question. Just yesterday... I had a gentleman from New York who has a home service brand reach out to me through a, through a referral. Most of my business is referral, although podcasts like this get me lots of business. And this gentleman was awesome. He was young. He was aggressive. He already has put partners in place in different cities doing his model. And he asked me the exact same question yesterday. And my answer to him was, you can continue to do exactly what you're doing. You can put partners in place. You can have attorneys writing up agreements and customizing those agreements. And he was actually getting a piece of the profits. Now, if you mimic a franchise and you're taking a piece off the top, like a typical franchise royalty, not a piece of the profits, and you try to duplicate that in most states, you're going to get a lot of trouble because it looks too much like a franchise. More than likely, a competitor will, will rat you out to you know, call the Capitol building that handles business and industry and oversees franchising in that state. And you're going to, you're going to have a big problem. So he was looking to take a piece of the profits from his partners. He said, no big deal. It's just a joint venture, but that's kind of a headache. You're going to do that in 50 cities, a hundred cities. You know, you're going to have people that'll cheat you on that. It's not going to work. So can you do it? 100%. My plan for him was continue doing what you're doing if you choose. But if you go the franchise route, not as much money as you think. 40 grand or so, set up a franchise system, depending on your attorney and your team. I could set it up for a little less than that through my attorneys. And and you're in business. When you go to exit a franchise system, private equity groups love the franchise system because there's that word again, system. That means the contracts are airtight in the favor of the franchisor. The royalty streams are predictable and will continue because you're collecting things off the top. And you're worth, as you exit as a franchisor, you're worth typically 10 times cash flow. So if you get X amount of franchisees in place, call it 50, they're all doing a million dollars in revenue. You have an 8% royalty. You're collecting 80000 a year in royalty. 
per franchisee. You have 100 of them, $800,000 a year times 10. Technically, you could exit for about $8 million bucks. That sounds like the Not biggest... Not bad in a little... The biggest difference between the private equity venture versus the franchise, private equity, you're you're sharing profits. We're yeah, in the franchise, bottom line, bottom line top, top line. line. And that's I mean, that's a really cool, yeah. really cool differentiating factor. But also what I saw is like you can probably scale private equity to three to five, mm -hmm. maybe ten, without really losing your locus of control. Mm -hmm. Versus franchise, you, you know, if you're gonna go to a hundred locations. Right. Right, it's going to be difficult you, to, to manage bottom as opposed to collect from top without breaking into you. You nailed it. Laws. You nailed it. And if you ask any franchise attorney the difference between just a franchising deal and a licensing deal, as an example, it's that one word you use control. You know, Ray Kroc, most people saw the founder, it's all about control. You don't, you don't want to be in that box? No problem. Go create your own brand. Yeah, and it, it's it's something that's super like unique, uh, but also, you know, as you as you think through what you want, right? One of the really cool things I have a lot of clients in that franchise space is leveraging time, mm -hmm. right? Because yes, if you're gonna go build fifty th of anything, if you do it yourself, it's gonna take you X amount of times. Versus if you do it with others, it's gonna you're gonna get there a lot quicker, right? So you, through their franchising models, they're able to get to 50, 100, 150 locations, right? Um, because they're leveraging other people's time and yes, your process. So pivoting to that side of the, your business, Lance, really quick, what are some like key items? Like, let's just say you're, someone reaches out to you and says, hey, I want to franchise. I imagine you do some sort of an audit on their business, right? Like you are saying, okay, let me understand your business. Yeah. What are some key items that you're looking for for someone to either get prepared to franchise or, you know, let's just say you go, hey, your systems and processes are not airtight. You're not ready to franchise. Like walk us through what that audit system looks like. Yeah, the first it, it's actually fairly basic. And number one, it has to do with do you have a profitable business? <laughs> do you have yeah. a profitable business <laughs> that you could teach other people how to do and Oh, by the way, uh, get a little royalty because there's enough profit. You know, I mean, look, if you have a business and you're netting 10%, no matter how great the business is, probably need to do some work first to get that profit margin healthier because you don't have enough to share. Yeah. Um, yeah. A, a future franchisee wouldn't have enough to share. So it has to do with the profitable business. It has to do with What's your secret sauce? Is there something proprietary enough that there's a reason for this? We've all watched episodes of Shark Tank. It's wonderful when they talk about, you know, what problem are you solving? You know, yeah. uh, to this day, when Five Guys Burgers came around, there were a lot of people in the business that groaned and said, not another burger brand, but they did something different. They, they went right in between fast food and, uh, you know, Red Robin and created, you know, one of the first fast casual burger brands, which people were craving and it worked. But at the time, most people would have thought, shit, another burger brand. We don't need that. So I look at what people are creating and why they think they're going to be successful. Like the gentleman yesterday in New York, I told him straight up, I said, you have too many too many revenue streams. You need to be more focused on the five core revenue streams, not the 10 that you're talking about. You need to focus more because anybody looking at buying into your franchise is going to say, shit, you're too complicated. There's too much stuff. So then it comes down to the person that I'm speaking to. Are they someone that is a believable, great leader and mentor because if they're not, they're not going to sell franchises. People want to believe, like with Ray Kroc, people believe that they he had something and people wanted it. So I've talked to some founders that literally say to me, yeah, I don't really like people. I said, well, that's fantastic. <laughs> Who the heck do you know that we can put as the face of your company? Because you're not selling anything with that attitude, buddy. Yeah. And, and in some cases, there is a logical 
person other than the founder. The founder might be a super genius, but there is logically someone that else we could put in place. So that those are really the most important things. Profitability, the founder, the systems and the, the secret sauce, the proprietary nature of what they're doing. I love, look, I have a buddy of mine that's now an owner and CEO of the first power washing brand. I know it sounds crazy. The first brand that'll probably be nationwide in franchising that does that focuses on power washing. But it's not a power washer you can walk into Home Depot or Lowe's and get. You can get a power washer there. That's not this proprietary power washer. You can clean a building four stories up from the ground you know, every level and speed and pressure and soap and sanitizer and all these things. And it's incredible. They'll do a parking garage for $20,000 for a big company in no time. Is there anything you can't incredible franchise? Business. What was that? Is there anything you cannot franchise? Nah, you know, there's, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm sure there is, but there has to be a system to what you're creating. So you have to have value. Everything in life, we all know, whether it's a burger or a franchise, there has to be value. The value in franchising, as we have discussed before already, is uh, often misunderstood. <laughs> um, but in most cases, I do look at some businesses that are not ready to franchise. So I'd like to say anything could be franchised. But are they really ready to franchise is another question. Yeah, I think the really cool part about this world as you dig into it is every business, if you're a business owner, entrepreneur, you should have the aim of franchising. Whether you choose yes. to franchise or not is a different because mm -hmm. all the principles that make a great franchise make, make a great, a great business, business mm -hmm. right? Like you listed yes. it out. If you want to be a good business, you got to have a profit. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to have a really good process. You've got to have unbelievable people. Product. Right? And you've got to have something that is different. Like, why would they do business with you? So anybody really should be aiming, like whether you're just getting started through the growth phase or a maturity phase, if you want to grow your business and take your business to the next level and really tactfully get to where you want to go, looking at a franchise playbook mm -hmm. can only help you because it's going to stress test everything that's going wrong. Because if you cannot take your business and plug it into somebody else for them to be successful, then you don't really have a business. Yeah, You just own a really good 100%. job. Yeah. Right? Yep. And, and, and you know, look, to, to that point, I know plenty of people where their first business is a franchise. They learn they learn all these things they didn't know before about business in general. And then they either keep that franchise forever, sell it, and then they start building their own things. Or they get into other franchises. Likewise, I have a gentleman who's worth $800 million plus that just bought a whole bunch of franchises for his kids. He was no longer going to create another business. He was retired. He wanted something his kids can do and know that somebody else is supporting him. And all he and his attorney have to do is make sure they're following the system. And oh, by the way, I'm their free business coach mm -hmm. after they invest. I'll, I'll be your free coach being a top franchisee in the past myself to make yeah. sure you stay on track. Where do you see things go wrong? Like, let's talk about like, because that's also another mm -hmm. parallel to being a good business owner, right? Like, where do you see franchising go wrong? Yeah, I, I think it's the same thing in any br any business. But while we're talking about franchising, quite simply, people pick the wrong franchise for them. I have a gentleman that owned a small home services brand, and he had the idea in his head that he wanted to do a business consulting type franchise. Um, and he settled on that. I warned him. I warned his wife. I said, you have never done sales like this, and there is a learning curve. I know it's a light investment. I know you think you're going to want to get up in the morning and have conversations with other business owners. It was strictly B2B. Within six months, he called me and goes, you're right, I don't like it. I mean, that's it. It doesn't get any more simple than that. He had this fascination, this lust, this fantasy that he's going to do a clean, white-collar business 
to get out of his blue collar business. It's as simple as it gets. It was a complete mismatch. And he convinced me that he can do it because he was a nice guy. So he ended up handing the business to his cousin, who was a salesman, salesperson. And uh, they worked out a deal and it was fine. It all worked out. But it was, in most cases though, people get into a business where it goes wrong and the, and something else, you know that whole squirrel thing? Squirrel, the next yeah. shiny object pops up. We don't have that problem. And they realize, I'm not going to do this business. And they hand the keys to the business to their son, their brother, their sister, their spouse, and say, I'm going to go do this new biotech company that I was planning 10 years ago and couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, so you're going to handle this auto franchise. And those people aren't suited for it. So typically, if every single franchise system, whether it's McDonald's, Fast Signs, or an HVAC franchise, there, there's a garage franchise that I represent. Garages. There's an owner that's going to exit for $100 million dollars garage repair and maintenance and replacement 100 million dollars i'm i'm gonna guess there's someone not successful in that franchise there's definitely people not successful in almost every franchise and it's typically the person well, it's always it's typically the person. the person i have people all the time that ask the question well lance how are you going to find me the right franchise I don't want the wrong franchise and I fail. I said, you're going to fail because of you, not the franchise, because I'm going to put you in the right franchise that all you have to do is do the work. Do you think- And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off. As someone's identifying risk, right? As a business owner, as an investment, right? Those three pillars of investments. Do you think franchising is the least risky? or the most risky, or where does it stand in the risk column? So let's go back to the skill set of the individual I'm finding a franchise for. There are times I'm talking to people, like a gentleman literally early this morning, a couple hours ago, 20 years in the Navy, he built up a couple of his own businesses, he's in his 50s like me, and he's like, Lance, I never thought I'd want a franchise, but... It's easier. So this guy will be successful at anything I put in his path because of his past success. Right. So what I tell people all the time is your skills are transferable. Now, if you're young and maybe you haven't developed, nothing wrong with it, a lot of smart young people out there that are in their 20s. But if you're young enough and you haven't developed enough skills Hey, if you have a great attitude, energy, sales ability, or business development ability, holy cow, I could put you in a lot of franchises and have you be successful. But overall, to answer your question, I do think when you work with someone like me, I think we can make sure that you are going to be successful. You get to get, get into a very light investment initially. There's a lot of franchises I have that are 150000 or less. Get an SBA Express loan. You put down your very little money. There's deals on SBA Express loans these days. The question becomes, though, I call it the bridge. If you have a job, how do you build that bridge to safely cross over that bridge? Is it a rope swing or is it a steel bridge (laughs) that you're building for yourself in order to cross over from W-2 to being the boss? And there are a shit ton of franchises that we call semi-absentee, the goofy franchise term we call semi-absentee, where you can keep your day job, hire somebody to run the business. You're still involved, but you're only spending 10 to 20 hours a week on the business, not necessarily in the business. So franchising is safe as heck when you are the right individual working with someone like myself. Awesome. Well, man, thank you so much. Dropping a bunch of, uh, of absolutely useful information. Um, this is, you know, I, I, I wanted to get into the nitty gritty of it. So I appreciate you letting us kind of not stay at the, at the high level and kind of get into it. Um, where can our audience find more of Lance? 
So I have a podcast, I on Franchising, EYE on Franchising. And uh, LanceGralic.com is is one of my many websites. That's the easiest one. If you could spell my name, G R A U L I C. We'll link it in the show notes for the for that and the podcast and your socials as well. Perfect. Um, yeah, Instagram. Uh, pretty big on Instagram. Love Instagram. Uh, but yeah, happy to talk to anybody. My services are free. In case you didn't realize that, my services are actually get free. I get paid something by my brands awesome. to help bring great people to them. So. Uh, Appreciate you guys having me. Very good, man. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And everybody, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Uh, we're going to continue to bring guests like this to continue to drive tactical value to the bottom line and helping you continue to invest in the difference makers to help grow and scale your life. Until the next one, see you around.